Hey everyone, I'm going to do another unboxing today. I guess I see topics or comments in the body of these unboxings or recaps. Um, so, I think it's kind of more interesting. Maybe it makes these segments work more than just cutting things open and popping bubble wrap. But uh, here is a, it is bendy, although it does say handle with care, do not bend this package. It's from a book rant, probably something from eBay. Um, it is basically like a a, a bubble wrapped um, bubble wrapped envelope. So here we go. I probably use the scissors to open things. Man, these are tougher than it seems they're pretty well there we go the flap opens up it would be very nice to be have it reusable but uh, you know probably these aren't one use things all right some twilight 2000 stuff and it's four items which is pretty cool Four items for my Twilight 2000 campaign. I'm just collecting everything. I mean, I have everything on PDF because I got the little thumb drive from uh, is it FFE Far Frontier Enterprises, so Mark Miller's company. Uh, but this is the RDF source book, which is um, basically the Persian Gulf. What's going on in the Persian Gulf and Twilight 2000? Um, so it's like a complete like sub campaign then I got going home which is kind of relatively thicker these are all in really nice condition um, slightly aged but uh, all in good shape and this kind of takes care of um, going home is basically you know going from Poland it's a pull out map covering northern Germany which overlaps with the pull out map in Poland and the map is there which is nice um, so it's an expansion and it basically talks about French units and German units and what's going on the Rhine um, so the dead zone east of the Rhine etc and the order of battle in those places and what you got to do to get out oh there's some handouts and adventure plots as well but then there is Armies of the Night, which I believe is the L.A. book. No, it's a New York book. Oh, okay, great. It's a New York City book. What's going on in, on in New York City during this crisis? This is cool. And then Air Lords of the Ozarks, which is a detailed background of New America. Um, cool. And new technology and what's going on in this new technology and ultralights and dirigible rules, which is kind of cool. Um, the, the lay of the land and how things look in these places. So it's probably like, uh, well, if you were to go north from Lone Star, Red Star, you go to the Ozarks, right? So um, it gives us a, yeah, Little Rock, Arkansas, and then and further north, Arkansas. Missouri, um, etc. Oklahoma a little bit, mostly Arkansas. And it gives you the lay of the land, etc. So very cool. More stuff for my uh, Twilight 2000 campaign. I'll put them back in the bag and then bag them up separately. I have, um, I have magazine-sized bags for all my vintage gaming wear. So added to the collection. I gotta find the space on a shelf on the shelf for it. My shelf is burgeoning and busting at the seams with stuff. There's my unboxing for T2K stuff. So in reference to the X card, myself as a player, I'm playing a war game, so it doesn't matter to me necessarily if things like that happen because I can separate reality from fiction. Even though as a human, 
I hate that one person will kill another for whatever reason that they have. But as a character, Kasha wouldn't have cared that much because she was raised not to help soldiers. And as a matter of fact, she helped one and was thrown out of her town. She was disowned by her parents. It caused a lot of debacles in her life. So as far as X cards go, I don't think it would be a bother to her because she's probably lived through it. So hope that helps. I ask myself why I smack my lips all the time as I start to record. I'm going to try to not do that and do the um and um and um thing. But in response to Amy's call-in, we're not using physical props in our Twilight 2000 session, but we're definitely going to talk about when, as a player, you raise your hand or send me a PM or say, hey, guys, I, I'm comfortable with this. And Amy outlines herself. I guess she explains that while killing and executing someone is heinous in real life, she's okay with it and it's okay for her character. So I guess this brings a question of separating fiction from reality. And some people are able to, and undoubtedly there is a trigger that I might have or that she might have where it's hard to separate. And that's why we have this ability and leave it, make it open and this open dialogue between the GM and the players that, hey, if something makes you uncomfortable, say something. And uh, then we can have fun in the game and not let people feel weird and reminding them of something in their past or that they don't doesn't sit well with them morally and uh, move on from there and play some games, explore these fictions. And honestly, I'm excited. If you didn't, couldn't tell from the unboxing that now I've accumulated even more T2K stuff. So not only do I have the T2K 4th edition PDFs and the big FFE thumb drive with everything that was published by GDW on PDF, but now I have physical copies. And I'm going to try to think off the top of my head what I have physical copies of. I have physical copies of Free City of Krakow, Pirates of the Vistula, Ruins of Warsaw, Black Madonna, Return to Warsaw, the Bear's Den? No, I don't know if I have the Bear's Den. No, I have White White Eagle, not the Bear's Den. I gotta collect that one. But go, then Going Home, Red Star, Lone Star, the RDF Sourcebook, Air Lords of the Ozarks, and hold on. And Armies of the Night. So those are the products that I've accumulated for use in my Twilight 2000. And I'll keep looking for good prices on these out of print items and we'll go from there. Hello Carl, I am calling in support of historical adventures, scenarios where you've got a known outcome. As a player in your Invictus game, I, I thought it was Re really interesting uh, I liked the fact that I didn't know too much about the events that, that we, we were playing through and as well as having fun I felt I was you know learning a little bit about this period in history you had a really good grasp you was keen we had a little bit of chat between us about the time team the old English TV series and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I also liked the way you um, allowed some some of the like lesser used traits on the Cthulhu sheet to be used. For example, we we were in an ambush, um, and I was actually looking at my sheet, thinking I'd like to do something different as a centurion. Is there some way I can? use some different skills to improve the situation for the guys that are, are, are there on the front line. And I forget how we worked it out now, but I thought there was a really satisfying resolution to it all. And I do remember we 
did seem to make some excellent roles just at the right time. We, As a group, I feel we were super lucky. Um, looking at this idea of doing things a little bit differently, I have got a question. Talking of social encounters, how how do you like to run your social encounters? Are they like skill challenges or, or what? Hey, Colin, thanks for the kind words and reminiscing about Invictus. I'm actually thinking of what I could do next for what historical backdrop I could use. I'm not quite sure yet, but the backdrop of AD 9, the Todeberg Forest, defeat of the three Roman legions was what I had chosen our Invictus adventure. And um, I thought it went really well and a testament that people are still talking about it about a year later from when we ran it is pretty cool. So how would I, what, how do I run social situations? I guess it depends on what game we're playing. I, my tendency is initially to let the players role play things out, but I know some players aren't comfortable with that. So if a player were not comfortable with that, then they could roll an appropriate skill, but I generally don't like cold rolls, even for perceptions. I like to ask it, or if the characters describe what they're doing, then I would say, hey, can you test this? So I think I that's my general tendency in social situations is let them play, role play things out with an NPC, and then see if a role is, is needed, or if they give me a good argument and ask the right questions, I just don't even sometimes use a role. I think this works best in a game that really promotes social interaction as opposed to all those combating things is Warhammer Fantasy. I mean, yes, out in the wilderness you are going to run into combat. That's where the trappings of society break down, but in a city you generally talk things out. And the characters, the players that I have are good with that and they enjoy it and then what i would usually do is then if, if a role is needed to persuade a particular npc then i have them roll and based on the role playing i give them a bonus or not or again if they ask the right questions right if they hit the right triggers on how i've decided how this npc is motivated and sometimes i don't roll and i guess i should i should adapt that to most things i think in the other time we have a lot of social situations seems to be in Savage Worlds. And in Savage Worlds, it amounts to the same thing. I'll give a bonus or not when a player attempts to persuade. But there's like a definite mechanic and you can definitely you know, like negatively affect the adversary NPC in Savage Worlds in that game or even in a game like like Twilight 2000 4th edition where I feel like there's necess because combat is so deadly there's almost a necessity for social interactions and one of the characters is very good at persuading in certain situations so that would also impose negatives on the adversaries or for example make us a, a tense situation sort of calm down um, so usually the player, though, takes the initiative to describe what they're doing. And I'm probably going to, based on your question now, I'm probably going to emphasize that, not just a cold roll, but tell me what you're doing. What is your argument? How are you trying to persuade this person? So there we go. That's a short answer to a pretty interesting question. And I wonder if any callers want to chime in and see how they handle a social situation. I mean, I've given examples of maybe three types of games, but there are games like in the Modifius 2D20 system where social combat is actually codified. So maybe that's something worth doing is to talk about infinity social combat or Dune social combat. Um, so we'll see. Thanks for the call again, Colin.
Wednesday was another session of our Iron Kingdoms 5e game, and we're almost done with it. So a lot of our discussion for the gaming session was what we're going to play next, and I put a poll in the Discord, and some people voted more than once before we said, no, no, just vote for the one that you want to play the most, not the ones that you like. And then one person hasn't voted, so it looks like there's a tie so far between the Modifius 2D20 Dune RPG and the new Starfinder Adventure Path Horizons of the Vast, or the first book at least. So we'll see how that goes. I think we have maybe one one session left of the Iron Kingdoms game, it looks like, depending on what the players did. they. Basically are underneath the graveyard in the city of Corvus in these Orgothian, which is a previous civilization who worship demons, their vaults, and they cleared the first room, which had some cultists and a big spellcaster cultist, and then they were going to see, or that combat was not tough, although it seems that in every single, every single game we run someone drops so someone dropped to an inflict wounds which is pretty brutal it does 3d 10 so it's a good chance that a previously injured from the previous combat player um, would succumb to it so that's what happened but uh, they did not die and the combat was over pretty quickly after that and um then they took a short rest to recuperate some hit points. They still have some, some potions from their employer. The captain of the guard gave them some potions to go fix the mess as payment to go fix the mess. And for the misunderstanding of arresting them. Um, and we'll see. Another interesting thing that I introduced is the arcane caster. is a war caster um, who controls a steam jack. They were heard the humming and the voice. All these there's all these mosaics and frescoes and statues with these demonic visages and the arcane caster can hear them. So he tapped into the madness, as it were, to give him some extra bonus on attack dice and damage. But at a consequence, everything was at a disadvantage and it would cause corruption in the long run. But maybe they're not so worried about it since we're probably going to wrap this up. But hey... If we pick it up again, they will have some corruption. So after that combat, they explored a little bit and they saw they could go, they came to a fort, they could go left or right. They went and explored each two people who were stealth stealth uh, people types. Um, I guess it was the gunslinger and the rogue went and explored in each direction. Uh, rolled, I had them roll their stealth since they were by themselves. They got some intel, they came back and surprisingly they weren't detected they got some intel and came back and they decided to avoid a room that had more creatures in it and pick the room that had less creatures that looked like to be some sort of torture chamber or dungeon cell so they attacked the creatures and they did pretty well um and i thought well, the coolest thing is they used some of the props that i had described there's an open iron maiden so the warcaster had the steam jack shove one of the bad guys into the Iron Maiden and they shut it, locked it, threw it into a holding cell and let that, I guess it, was, it actually was an undead creature that had two weapons for hands and they shoved it into a cell and locked it up and then the other character was able to remove the weapon grabs and keep the necrotic resonance alive so they have magic weapons, I don't know for how long. Um, a magic shovel or bladed weapon and a magic hook, right? So just little hand weapons that uh, have some magic. They might need it. I don't know. We don't know. So we'll see how they go the next time and uh, maybe finish this up. The other game I played, or another game I played this week or weekend, starting off on Friday with our, I don't, I guess it's called Friday Night Role Playing, 
although for us it's afternoon. But it's a really cool group with Shea Webster of Roleplay Rescue, Arlen Walker of Live from Pelham's Wasteland, Jason Connerly from, well, Nerds RPG, have already picked cast. And it looks like another player, we, and we've been playing Savage Through the Samurai, and another player is going to join us, Evil Jeff of Minions and Musings podcast is going to join us, so that's going to be pretty cool. So this fr past Friday, and we're going to do like a small short session, it seems, we played The Strange, which is a cipher system game, and it's by Bruce Cordell and Monty Cook from Monty Cook Games, and it's really, this is like a dimension hopping type game, at least that's how I conceive it, where Earth is prime, maybe? But there are a series of other dimensions called recursions that are that exist in the universe. And uh, I think it's pretty cool concept. A big in, an interesting draw is that you are or if you create a character in the in Earth Prime, then when they go to another dimension recursion, some of their abilities or things change. Definitely their form can change. And their form probably likely changes unless they're humans on that recursion, but sometimes they're not. Um, so that's something that will be pretty cool, I hope, as the game develops, that we kind of change form and change abilities. So Shea Webster is running this game, and my character is a, I think, well, the cool thing also I always like about Cypher is that there's this description, like a sentence description of your character which basically encompasses their abilities. So my character is a lucky vector who is licensed to carry. So that means that lucky is sort of the descriptor and vector is the sort of is the class, um, the role, and who is licensed to carry is their focus. So these kind of generate your abilities and how you go about your game, but it's kind of neat in a sentence that you can describe your character. So my character is Yamada Diaz. She is a, like I said, a lucky vector who's licensed to carry. Uh, we started this game in San, like Santa Monica, California. My character, it's fun to roll random backgrounds. My character, we know about the estate and that things go weird and we're kind of like troubleshooters. Um, maybe not high level troubleshooters. We maybe just got involved in the group and this estate group. Who is, are the people who like know that there's this dimension hopping that goes on and they're trying to prevent I guess, complete calamity and chaos in the multiverse. So, at least that's my understanding. Or, I don't know, that's a way to conceive it in my mind. I don't know the exact wording in the strange book, but that's how I look at it. Anyway, Ziamata has a, um, she has a health food store, or health food restaurant and store, probably. Um, she got into the strange, or into the estate, because uh, she, uh, escape death by falling into a manhole and underneath the manhole in the little sewers there in LA Santa Monica area um, she found something strange and she has a connection to one of the characters um, which is basically Jason Connolly's playing Nicolas Cage in Earth Prime and she has a connection to Nicolas Cage because he can help her to find he has he has the, the the in to find her guns and get them at a good price. So the license to carry gives her an ability that increases her gun damage. Uh, the lucky gives her a, like an extra small pool of points that she can use to mitigate the uh, the resource management of effort when you tap into your pools to lower the difficulty of things. So um, yeah, that's pretty cool. And as a vector, which is kind of a fighter type, she has an edge in might and speed. I made her more speed focused with giving her abilities such as running and a defensive ability and shooting. She's going to do a lot of shooting. So, um, so there, that's her. So in this game, we were contacted that there's been a series of, of murders or, or deaths that are occurring and we saw a pattern. We are called in to investigate uh, Jason's character 
uh, being Nick Cage attracted a lot of attention when we went to go visit the police station to get some information and intel. So that's a kind of a reoccurring thing in the background. And I, I definitely think here as a side comment that Shea Webster did a great job of using the GM intrusion vehicle to throw complications in our way and task us to figure out how to manage, uh, you know, Nick Cage and his persona, among other things. So uh, we went to, after the detective office, we went to um, a couple of the sites of the killings. And I discovered it was some sort of creature that had claws that could pounce, that um, liked to be up. Uh, so we looked at both, we got some clues from both places. And from the second place, I decided, well, I'm going to start try to track it since I was able to get an idea of how this, character, this creature moved. And I split up with the party and they went to follow another lead, going to um, an antique shop. And I went to uh, an abandoned warehouse where I spotted a bat-like creature with a whip. And I did not stay and try to fight it. I shot it and ran. And yay, running, and the dice were with me. Actually, the dice were generally with me um, during this session, which is a good thing. Because I thought I was placed in harrowing situations. Um, I called up my buddies. I guess that's the interesting thing is like it's a it's a modern world, so we're trying to do things and try to be smart about it with our cell phones and keeping communication and like I'm taking pictures and recording things as best I can. Um so that's pretty cool. Um one of the fun GM intrusions that that Shay introduced was when I was taking a picture of the sleeping bat like creature, the flash on the phone went off I was like, uh oh. So that was pretty neat. It's fun. Because, you know, that would happen in any, like, action type of detective story. When someone's sneaking around and they step on the glass or the flash goes off, you know. I think that was cool. It felt definitely like a like if this were, like, a, a, a TV program. I like the episodic nature. Like an investigative drama, like Fringe, uh, where Nick Cage is a star. I don't know who quite who my person would be. Let me think about that. I guess she probably might look like Ana de Armas, who is in Knives Out and a little younger in Blade Runner, but uh, athletic looking, tall, lit, dark hair. So anyway, it'd be a cool show. And uh, so anyway, uh, I ran from the creature first, called my, my backup which was my buddies. Uh, unfortunately, we did not bring Nick Cage's car, which would have my assault rifle in it. So I had to rely on my guns. But we had some tricks. And uh, when the other two got here, so, oh, um, Arlen's playing a, uh, like a scientist professor named Dr. Bass, who would be played by Jeremy Irons in the television show. So there you go. That's what we got. And then... Uh, we pushed into the warehouse. The creature was waiting. I shot. Arlen tossed a grenade. We got our actions off before the creature went. We exploded the creature and shot it up to bits. It was dead. I rolled really well on my attack again. Did extra damage. So uh, then we went back to the antique shop and like, well, is there another one? Where is this coming from? We discovered that someone had messed with this wardrobe and this wardrobe had an outer door and an inner door. The inner door, the it was slightly ajar and it had been opened. We opened that and Arlen's character stepped through and disappeared. We followed and we were in some sort of cave and it was hot and it smelled like fire and brimstone. And we were informed that we were in purgatory. And that's more or less where we stopped. Nick Cage jumped back and uh, we are stuck in this demi-plane or recursion where there might be demons and devils and the like. So thanks, Shay, for running. It was really fun, and I look forward to more with my character, Ziamara Diaz.
this morning I so all right so that's a, a song by a famous metal band bracketing the recap of the strange because we're in purgatory sky is burning red and all that this morning I played in another game so I've been I other than running the IK5e it looks like I am only going to be playing in games this week I might have to remedy that hmm in any case, I played a session of our ongoing Reavers of Too Late campaign run by Kevin Madison of the Dungeon Musing Media Empire. And I play a necromancer, a warlock named Iphigenia Acantadoros. She is Amazonian and she is badass, pretty much. Um, and we've continued from the previous adventure where myself and another character uh, were holding up in a cave. Uh, some other characters arrived. As a side note, Kevin is really good. I mean, it, normally there's a group of players that regularly play, but it doesn't always happen. Um, and we have, we had today, for example, three. The previous time I played, we had two. So Kevin is really good at figuring out why there's only a few of us here. I don't know what, how he will, what the rationale he will give for why the other person took off. Maybe they went out to go looking for supplies or hook up with the other characters and I was going to stay put. I don't know. But they weren't there. And we didn't really explain it in-game. It just, they weren't there. So <laughs> these other two characters show up. Um, we explore some of this cave that we're holding up in. And we, uh, we find some very interesting... Uh, sort of runes that had treasure like we found a rune covered rod uh, we passed through a room with a bunch of frogs that didn't seem hostile but they were making a lot of noise and it was very disconcerting we crossed over a underground stream and my character just walking on water because of the properties of one of their magic items and eventually you know we got to a, there was a lot of exposition to explain like the what we found in these rooms with all these runes and the treasures that we found, which was very cool. Uh, Arlen Walker's character had a long exposition with his crystal ball head thing that he has, which was neat. A lot of information about the world, which I always appreciate from Kevin's games. Eventually we found this like larder of some sort. And in the larder was a giant frog thing. And uh, we fought it. It was I, myself and Arlen's character did not get injured, but another player, they suffered from the attacks of this creature. It lashed with, with its tongue. We used the meta currency we have, which is Astonishing Fortune, to not be dragged in. Eventually, this player ran out of the meta currency and was pulled into the maw of this creature and got chomped. Meanwhile, Arlen and I were trying to use magic to blow it up. I used... A proper actually I use my shooting ring of shooting stars a lot this game it's one of those kind of pocket knife type of magic items that is very prevalent in these older incarnations of the game but it's like it's very specific where you can use it and what properties you can use depending if you're outdoors at night or underground in a subterranean environment so I use my in, infrared vision um, which would last for a long time 12 hours is like a level 10 magic item basically um, and then I used my fairy fire to light to help light the way for the players as I was walking on water and I could see more or less in the dark and I let, let the way for them as they were crossing the stream and then I used my spark shower against the big creature so I also used the scythe of the reaper which I rolled a crit upon and did a ton of damage uh, Arlen was also using magic to keep things going and blast the thing or smack the thing with his uh, magic uh, macho wheedle of force and eventually I blasted it with a lightning bolt but it was too late for poor Reagan that was the name of the character who got chomped by the frog which is unfortunate because Reagan has been one of the was one of the first characters original characters in the campaign we haven't lost a lot of characters um, Arlen's lost a couple, I think that's a, maybe the third perma, perma loss, 
Um, it does use sort of a AD and D unearth arcana mechanic where you can go to minus ten or so. I believe that's from unearth arcana. I think it's in in the original AD and D. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head uh, what the rule is, but I feel like it's from unearth arcana that you know you basically bleed out until you're negative ten and then you die. That's where they had spells like um, prayer for the dying or or things like that where you could stabilize someone. Um, they develop spells to do that and give a person a chance so when they get to zero they're not quite dead. So I feel that was introduced between A D and D first and second edition. But I could be wrong. There might be there are better scholars out there about rules and when these things came up in the game. In any case, Reagan perished. He cut the creature open trying to save Reagan, but alas there are pieces and parts of the poor person Rune Carver. So we created, we collected all the loot, we made a cairn, we left the loot that was important, or the items that were important to Reagan for the next group of adventurers to come along, right? It's like Arlen said, you know, take a penny, leave a penny, but it's take a magic item, leave a magic item. So we found some good loot, and that's where we stopped, so we'll pick up the next time. But uh, Lo, does Reagan go to Valhalla now? Or actually, for Iphigenia in her in her mythology, Reagan is now running across the Elysian fields. So thanks, Amy and Colin, for the Collins. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I think I'm going to end it here before it gets super duper long. Tomorrow starts. RPG a day and I have some ideas to maybe do that maybe not do a podcast a day because that would be kind of crazy but do a series of small segments and then put it out at the end of the week although for tomorrow I probably have an episode that I'm going to put out since the prompt word is going to be scenario but take care thanks for listening and I'll talk to you all soon